Decisions made in Washington and Ottawa impact every aspect of Canada-U.S. relations. In this dialogue, we have the policymakers themselves discussing the way decisions are made, the political realities they face, and the pressures and opportunities that come with serving in the United States Congress and Canadian House of Commons. Let me introduce these gentlemen. To my immediate right is Conservative Member of Parliament Rob Merrifield from Alberta. Many of you know him. Many people in Washington know him as well. I think you spend more time at the Canadian Embassy than Gary Dewar does. Oh, no. But, but uh, he's a great ambassador, by the way. We like him a lot there. Um, Rob was first elected to the House of Commons in 2000, was re-elected in 04, 06, 08, and 11 as the Member of Parliament for Yellowhead. He served as the chair of the House of Commons Standing Committee for Finance and the chair of the Canada-U.S. Interparliamentary Association. And you're hosting them, right? They're coming back? Uh, Canada-U.S. Interparliamentary guys? Yes. Yes. So stay tuned for that. Um, we're going to try to do a little hospitality when they travel up here. Uh, Rob has previously served on the Health Committee in many capacities, including chair, official opposition, senior health critic, and vice chair. In 2008, Prime Minister Stephen Harper asked Rob to serve as Minister of State for Transport. Also in 08, he was honored uh, to be summoned and appointed for life to Her Majesty's Privy Council of Canada. He's also served as a, measure, a member of the Treasury Board. He's currently the chair of the House of Commons Standing Committee on International Trade and a member on the Board on Internal Economy, which is the governing body of the House of Commons. Uh, in addition, and the reason I see him so much in Washington, is he's been given a mandate to work closely with the U.S. Congress, bless your heart, <laughs> um, in cooperation with the Canadian okay. Embassy on issues <laughs> relevant to Canadian interests. So that's Rob. Let me introduce everybody. Next to Rob is Congressman Bill Owens of New York State. Congressman Owens has represented New York's 21st district since November 2009. I have to tell you something. In Washington, when you do government relations, often what you're doing is looking for meetings uh, to discuss important policy issues with, uh, with members of Congress. And uh, one day, a couple of years ago, my phone rang, and it was Chief of Staff to Congressman Bill Owens, and, and it said, uh, Mr. Owens would like to see you. Well, we hadn't really met, and I said, oh, happy to see the congressman. You know, I feel like I'm being called to the principal's office. But he said he's, he read a quote of yours from the Canadian American Business Council in the Wall Street Journal and wants to talk to you about Canada-U.S. issues. And you've really exerted quite a lot of leadership uh, on Canada-U.S. issues, and we're incredibly grateful, and you're a terrific partner. But back to the bio. Before being elected to Congress, Bill had never run for public office. He's now the representative for the second largest congressional district east of the Mississippi. After graduating from law school, Bill enlisted in the U.S. Air Force and served as a captain at Plattsburgh Air Force Base, which is now in your district, or riding, right? Right. So that's pretty cool. Welcome. <laughs> Finally, we have new Democratic Party Member of Parliament Don Davies of British Columbia, one of the most beautiful places in the world, by the way. That's right. I was just in Nanaimo. I don't know if, if you represent that area, but BC is gorgeous. Yeah, that's overseas. Nanaimo's overseas. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Don is Canada's official opposition critic for international trade. Uh, and by the way, I think you canceled a trade meeting so that you could be here, right, Rob? So well, we, we got efficient. It was a short meeting. Oh, okay. Well, we're glad you're here and your colleagues are here from the House of Commons. Don's uh, as I said, critic for trade, official opposition, opposition deputy critic for citizenship. Wait a minute, this is a long title, I gotta read it. Immigration and Multiculturalism and Vice Chair of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Trade. A member of a number of parliamentary groups, he also serves on the executive of the Canada, China, Canada, Europe Parliamentary Associations and is Canadian Parliament Delegate to the Council of Europe. So welcome and thank you for coming. Alrighty, let's get started. Since I introduced you last, why don't we have you talk first, Don? Maybe, because we're a Canada-U.S. group, maybe you could talk a little bit um, from your point of view with the NDP. Um, what, what do you see as the challenges and opportunities facing uh, the Canada-U.S. relationship, specifically with respect to trade? Well, I understand I have three hours. Exactly. To, to <laughs> Nobody that. wants to eat lunch here, right? Uh, uh, sure. I'm going to start uh, by saying I, I, th I thought the format was that we had five to seven minutes to, to open up, and so I had all these prepared notes, but I'm going to abandon them. So if you, if you bear with me, I'm just going to uh, adopt a, a more conversational tone about this. It'd be this. good if you'd throw them with flourish. Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> abandon the script. You've been to the House of Commons. You see what, <laughs> there how you we go. act there. Um, you know, first and foremost, I think uh, it, it bears repeating that the Canada-U.S. trade relationship is the largest and most comprehensive in the world. Uh, I think $710 billion um, in 2012 in two-way trade passed between our two countries. Um, 
75% uh, of Canada's exports go to the U.S. And to put that in context, our number two export destination, the U.K., takes 4.5% of Canada's exports. Um, and uh, we take 50%. 50% of our imports come from the United States as well. But, you know, to, to New Democrats, I think to all Canadians, the, the trade relationship with the United States is not just a quantitative one. It's, it's a special and unique uh, relationship on qualitative terms as well. You know, we, um, we share much more than just economic uh, uh, integration. And, of course, it bears repeating that our two economies are extremely economically integrated with many sectors um, having uh, um, supply chain integration. Uh, I think also one thing that's uh, changed in the last, I'd say, four or five years with the, uh, with the, uh, the problems with the Doha round uh, and really the decline in multilateral trade negotiations is that we're seeing the emergence of regional and plurilateral trade blocks formed. And I think what that's done is it's heightened the requirement and the need for Canada, the U.S., and in fact, North America to um, get closer together and to, to craft policies that not only are good for our individual countries, but are, are good for North America as a whole. From the New Democrats' point of view, uh, the, uh, a sound uh, Canada-U.S. trade policy is based on four fundamental pillars. One is uh, robust infrastructure in, in both countries, and of course, I'll maybe speak a bit about Canada. Number two, administrative capacity at the border. Uh, three, um, um, uh, we need respect for international agreements so that we have a rules-based system of resolving the inevitable disputes that will occur. And fourth, a more equitable sharing of the Stanley Cup. Um, uh, and may I suggest coming Our from Canadians Vancouver... Our Canadians can beat your Canadians. That's all I'm going to say about that. We're from Vancouver. We have never won. I mean, this is a matter of fundamental fairness that I'd like to spend a little bit of time on. Um, so I, I had planned on talking about just three examples of this, so I'll just be very brief. Um, three opportunities and challenges, I think, can be expressed. Uh, the first one I was going to talk about is the Windsor-Detroit uh, crossing. Uh, I think it's the largest and uh, most important trade corridor in the world, something like a billion dollars of, of goods uh, services pass through that point every day. 35% um, of Canada's daily trade goes through that point. And so um, one thing that I think is imperative and I'm really happy to see, and my colleague Brian Massey is here from Windsor who's been pushing for a long time, as, as have many people in this room, for modern infrastructure at that, at that point. Um, it's going to create tens of thousands of jobs to create uh, the, the new crossing. Um, I think millions, it's not an exaggeration to say that millions of uh, jobs on both sides of the border depend on us uh, uh, being able to move goods uh, very efficiently through there. And it's kind of jarring to think that a lot of that massive enterprise is dependent on a single 84-year-old bridge. Um, you know, we as New Democrats would like to see uh, the, that crossing put under a joint Canada-U.S. public administrative body uh, because we think it's, it's of critical national importance to both of our countries. Um, we also uh, like the fact, I, I think, that there's a, an agreement to uh, put U.S. and Can Canadian steel and, and inputs into that bridge, which is kind of a little bit counter to a complete free market, Milton Friedman, uh, Ricardo-type approach to trade, but it's uh, good for, I think, the North American economy. Uh, so I think there's an opportunity there for, and an example to show that how trade is not just about agreements and paper. It's about making sure we have infrastructure on the ground that actually helps our exporters access that market. Number two, in terms of administrative capacity, uh, and a good example is uh, the initiative that was taken a few years ago to require passports at the border. Um, I think it's a, it's a minor example, but it's, it's an example of how a policy decision that may be taken for good reason, I think it was uh, to respond to uh, U.S. concerns for security, can be a border thickening um, initiative and measure. Um, I don't think that um, uh, the promises that were made to make passports uh, more affordable and accessible have really come to pass. And if you think about a Canadian family of four, um, getting passports for five years, you're talking about $400. Um, and so what that's done is it's hampered tourism, it's hampered the social and economic exchange between the two countries, and little measures like that can, I think, um, I think uh, cause us problems. And the final example that I would use is um, um, of, of international agreements is, of course, the COOL example. 
Um, you know, we... Uh, Those of us who aren't cool, you might want to explain. Okay. Country uh, of origin. Country of origin labeling, labeling yeah. for beef. Um, uh, the United States brought in um, regulations that required uh, us to um, identify where cattle uh, comes from and uh, again the goal is often laudable and it was to I think allow the US consumer to know when they were purchasing uh, US beef. Problem is is that cattle uh, we have a very integrated uh, beef industry between our two countries and cattle from the time of birth to slaughter will often cross the border several times so it's uh, it's adding I think it's been estimated by the USDA about 500 million dollars of cost very onerous uh, reporting requirements and it's really hurt the Canadian beef producers but it's also hurt uh, US packers and producers as well and um, you know Canada filed a complaint to the WTO where we were successful and uh, the USDA has responded with what we perceive as more stringent requirements of labeling so um, but I'm 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 confident that uh, I guess as I said in a big relationship like this it's you're bound to have um, uh, issues that come up from time to time. What's important, I think, is that we um, we have uh, fast and effective and efficient ways to resolve those disputes when they do occur. Uh, finally, finally, what I'll say is the larger questions exist on trade that I think we grapple with on both sides of the border is as we seek to liberalize trade between our two countries and the world and reduce harmful trade barriers, <clears throat> how do we do so and still attract manufacturing jobs to North America? maintain um, value, our ability to, to add value and create those, those kind of jobs that we want in our countries. How do we maintain the, the democratic um, uh, legislative flexibility to respond to economic crises, to be able to legislate in terms of the environment and, uh, and local economic development, like, like the stimulus funds that both our countries uh, expended and I think were critical to helping us weather the recession. These are our, our large issues. Um, and uh, I said finally twice. This is my last time. <laughs> Bill Clinton, I think, Third asked a great question. Third time's the charm, dude. Great question. Okay. The, uh, it's like a hat trick. Yeah. yeah. Go for um, it. Bill Clinton, in his book, raised a question when he and Nikki Cantor, um, I think, uh, basically adjusted the Democratic P Party's position on trade in the U.S., and that's something that we're doing here, and I'm sure we'll get into it, by asking the key question, which is, um, how do we make sure that the benefits of, of globalization and liberalized trade are more equitably distributed and the citizens of both our countries who often are asked to uh, bear the brunt of the dislocation that happens from these things, how can we make sure that those are ameliorated? And those are some of the considerations I think that both our countries will have to deal with in the years ahead. Thanks, Don. Bill Owens, you're up here from Washington, D.C. I have late breaking news from Washington. I don't know if people um, are familiar with the debate that's happening in Washington about the political incorrectness of the name of our football team, the Washington Redskins. I don't know if that's gotten coverage up here. The DC City Council um, actually had a vote on it, even though um, the Redskins are in Maryland um, where they practice, but here it is. The Washington Redskins are changing their name because all of the negativity, shame, humiliation, dissent, polarity, <coughs> adversity, defiance, hatred, animosity, contempt, discrimination, division, violence, counterproductivity, ill spirit, ungodliness, hostility, and utterly abhorrent political incorrectness associated with their name. From now on, they will simply be known as the Redskins. <laughs> What in the world on. is going on in Washington? And like is, is the government shut down? Is it open? Is, it, is the deal going to stick through till uh, January when you've got more votes? So help us understand the climate down there and uh, what's really happening. It sounds from your statement and question that my time has been fully utilized. <laughs> <laughs> Already. <laughs> Um, certainly, if you've been reading the papers, watching television, you know that we have a bit of a problem in D.C. Uh, having recovered from uh, the shutdown and then the debt ceiling vote, um, it is a very difficult process that we're going through. Uh, I think that there's some possibility that we come out of this in a position to uh, hopefully move forward. I will tell you when you said it's nice to be in Canada, it certainly is. Uh, I love to go home um, because uh, when I'm flying in over Lake Champlain, I'm thinking, uh, how does this get any better, uh, particularly when I've left the environment uh, that we're currently operating in. Um, to bring this back to the trade issue, though, with the United States and Canada, uh, I live in a unique place. I live in Plattsburgh, New York. 
Um, Clinton County, uh, which is a county of 83,000 people, and uh, some of you have heard me say this before, the economic impact of Canadian activity, trade, tourism, et cetera, $1.6 billion a year for 83,000 people. You do the math, that's a pretty significant economic impact. So for us, this is very personal. When I look out my uh, back windows, I happen to live on Lake Champlain in the summertime, and I look at Valcor Island, what I see is lots of Canadian flags on boats. And I have to tell you, I'm very happy. Uh, about 80% of the boats in the marinas on the New York side of Lake Champlain are Canadian owned. We have about 200 Canadian companies that have subsidiaries in Clinton County. The impact for us is daily. So we really understand what trade is about with Canada and what the impact is. I can tell you that in Washington, the focus of the conversation is consistently on the southern border. If you were to ask most of my colleagues and most of my constituents what comes into their mind when you talk about immigration, uh, they would tell you someone of Mexican descent. They would not focus on somebody who lives a half a mile across the border from them. So we've largely missed that boat, in my opinion. There's two ways to look at this. One is we are not the focus, uh, and that's a bad thing because they may move resources from the northern border to the southern border. The other is does it create opportunity? Why do people in the United States not think very much about the northern border. It's because it works. It does all the things a border is supposed to do. Do we need tweaks? Sure it does. But it fundamentally works. It is secure. Uh, people move and goods move back and forth across that border very effectively, very efficiently. Uh, so from my perspective, this is about taking the opportunity to make tweaks to our relationship uh, which has been pointed out numerous times, is the largest uh, in the world. Virtually any of the other free trade agreements we're talking about are minuscule comparatively. My view uh, is that when you have something that works, you devote resources to it to strengthen it because you don't want to allow it to weaken and put us in a position uh, where uh, we are uh, moving in a negative direction. One of the other things that has been alluded to in a number of the conversations I've had here over the last 24 hours, as we become, the United States become energy independent, um, Canada largely is energy independent, uh, that will change, in my view, uh, the real movement that people are afraid of uh, that occurs with trade agreements, and that is jobs being shipped overseas. I think there's real opportunity if we get our act together in terms of filling those unfilled jobs that we have, getting the skill sets we need, because we will have energy resources which will put us in a position to allow us to bring those jobs back to what ultimately is the largest market in the world, if you include Canada, the United States, and uh, Mexico. Uh, it will allow us to become an exporter to Europe and potentially to Southeast Asia. So from my perspective, this is an opportunity to strengthen a relationship that we have and to use the tools that we use along the U.S.-Canadian border uh, to really strengthen both, com both countries. Thank you so much. And we'll come back to some of these conversations about, um, about the border and about skills. But before we do, we want to uh, give Rob Merrifield a chance to, to jump in. Um, and I know you can talk about all of these topics. I'm really interested, though. Um, it, it hasn't been reported so much in the press in the last few days, although it's a big deal to, uh, to me as somebody who pays attention to these things. Canada and the European Union uh, just entered a, an agreement uh, for trade. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. And, and also, how does that bode for the agreement that Canada and the United States are in together, or the negotiation, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Sure. No, I appreciate the question. And, uh, uh, you're right. You haven't heard an awful lot about it. It's something about a Senate out there that uh, seems to have sucked a lot of the wind out of it. 
But nonetheless, it is the most comprehensive agreement that we've had between two, any two countries anywhere in the world. I, actually, I was challenged, uh, challenged by the uh, New Zealand uh, High Commissioner and said, uh, you know, really? That's more comprehensive than uh, New Zealand, Australia? I said, yes, it is. And he took a look. He had to agree with me. It is the most comprehensive of any two countries in the world. Uh, it will be, it, it's a wonderful in the sense that it's, you know, $12 billion benefit to Canada, you know, $1,000 per family actual, you know, per year income, 80,000 jobs. That's, that's one thing, it's all good. But the real benefit is it's the gold standard in an agreement that will be the one that other agreements uh, push toward. And, and you mentioned TPP and we're part of the TPP. I believe the European Canada Free Trade Agreement, the CETA, uh, will actually push those agreements, uh, that negotiating table to a more comprehensive level. It'll also be very interesting to see whether uh, the United States and uh, Europe, who have just started negotiations, whether they can uh, achieve the same standard of, of depth in their agreement. Uh, this, I believe, is that the Canada-Europe agreement will push those negotiations further that direction, which is good for all of us. And so that's the real benefit. Uh, there is. There is an interesting thing that's happened in Canada uh, compared to the United States. I'm, you're right, uh, Scotty, I'm down in D.C. quite a bit working on major, many, many different issues, but uh, uh, with my counterparts. Uh, one thing that they're saying is that is a bit of an anomaly between Canada and the United States. How, did, how is Canada doing well through this recession and, and, uh, and the United States has, has struggled somewhat? Well, before we get on our high horse in Canada, we should understand we didn't go through a housing collapse or a, or a financial collapse. But uh, allow me to get on the high horse a little bit. We went in a different direction. We, we did lower taxes in all sectors. Uh, that's personal, small business, uh, corporate. In fact, our corporate is 15% compared to 35%. We're actually bringing in more revenue at 35% than we did at 28. But that's, that's one thing. We, we lowered taxes, freed up the private sector on regulatory uh, op opportunities for the private sector to grow, and then went after international markets, which are these free trade agreements. Uh, watch for not only uh, Europe uh, free trade agreement, which is very good, uh, TPP uh, bilateral with Japan is moving along very quickly. Uh, we, we're working very aggressively also with India and other uh, trade agreements, specific alliance is something we're watching very closely as well. Thanks. Just while we're talking about um, trade, one of the differences that, that I observe all the time between the Canadian parliamentary system, the U.S. Uh, constitutional system of democracy is in, in, in the system up here, if you have a majority uh, government, you can pretty much do what you want to do, right? Um, in the United States, we have divided government. Congress has equal power uh, to the president, even when they're of the same party. So, um, Bill, I want to ask you, in order to get a trade deal done in the United States, the president has to have um, something called trade promotion authority, what people refer to as fast track. Mm -hmm. um, you're a free trader. We appreciate that about you. Not every Democratic member or Republican member of Congress is. Do you think the president in his will be able to get um, fast track authority on these deals? And also, related to Rob's point, uh, tax reform is on, is on the agenda uh, at some point. The president talked about it uh, earlier this week in Washington at a, at a thing we were at. So tax reform and trade promotion authority, what do you think? Uh, from the point of view of tax reform, I see that as a very heavy lift in this environment, uh, yeah. given the fact that we still have to deal on January 15th with a uh, continuing resolution to keep the government going, and then on uh, February 7th with raising the debt ceiling again. I think that's going to take a lot of the air out of the room. Uh, so I would be very surprised if that moved along in the absence of a big deal. If we got a big deal, then tax reform clearly would be part of that. We also have immigration being pushed, immigration reform. Um, so those, I think, are going to struggle till we have an understanding of where we're going on the, uh, the uh, continuing resolution slash budget and the, and the debt ceiling. Uh, I think the focus will be on the latter two. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can get something done, uh, although um, I think if I were betting, I would anticipate another CR on the 15th of January. Kick uh, the can again. Kick the can again. Yeah. Um, How far? Well, that's, I think it's a 60, 90 day kick of the can. Um, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, I think that there is a reasonable possibility we could shut down again. Um, I don't think that that's out of the realm of possibility at all. Um, there is uh, this political stalemate in D.C. 
uh, that makes it very difficult for people to come together in order to uh, reach um, a rational conclusion. Uh, in terms of TPP and fast track, um, that's a fairly complicated uh, question. Uh, I belong to a group called the New Dems, which tend to be a free trade orientated group, a little more conservative group uh, of uh, about 50 people. That process um, has become a little problematic even for us because of the way it's being uh, done or negotiated. No one knows what's in the document, uh, and so there's some concern about voting for fast track when you don't know what you're voting to approve. Right. So I think that there's going to be some yin and yang until we get more information. I think at the end of the day, uh, there will be fast track approval, and there'll be an up or down vote. Uh, but I think people are really going to push very hard to see the detail before they agree. And I think that that's not just Democrats, but I think it's Republicans it's as good well. good policy. Read something before you vote on it. Yeah, it's, that. It is, it is extraordinarily good policy, I think. And um, it, it probably is our job. Yeah, one could argue, absolutely. <laughs> Bill, you mentioned immigration reform. Don, that's a big issue in the United States. It's huge. Um, in terms of the politics, uh, and it's hu huge in terms of what business leaders like those here um, think is the future of uh, our economy. Uh, you have portfolios for multiculturalism and immigration. I've observed over the years, I think pe everybody's observed, that Canada really has um, what I would consider progressive approach to being more welcoming um, of immigrants. Do you think, uh, as part of building your society here, do you think that there are lessons um, for the United States to learn from the Canadian experience, or, or are you guys just smarter and better? Bill's looking at me. <laughs> He's bigger than I am, too. Um, I, I wouldn't be presumptuous enough to say that there's any lessons to be learned. I, I, I do think that um, each country has, um, has similarities and, and there's some significant differences. I mean, the U.S. approach has always been the melting pot, whereas Canada has uh, adopted a policy even officially of, of official multiculturalism. So we, we've got different cultural, I think, uh, expectations about, about how we integrate our societies. But what I, I, I don't know what the situation in the United States is uh, in this regard, but I know that in Canada, um, uh, there seems to be consensus that relatively soon, I've seen estimates as soon as 2016, uh, as late as 2019, that Canada will be dependent uh, for immigration, on immigration for 100% of our new job growth, to fill new jobs. So that means that uh, we're, we've, uh, we're approaching rapidly the point where for every retiree exiting the workforce, we have one Canadian entering it, a one for one. So we can replace our workforce, but what we cannot do is, is grow it. And so this leads to interesting uh, questions about, um, about our immigration policy. And one question that we always have is every year in September, the Minister of Immigration must table a report in House of Commons that tables the number of permanent resident visas that will be issued the following year. And we've been pretty steady at 250,000 a year for about the last uh, five or six years. Um, there are those, and I'm one of them, who believe that that number should be adjusted in light of the demographic reality and in light of the economic needs of our, of our, uh, of our employers to start looking at boosting that to 1% of population, which would be, uh, with a population of 35 million, about 350,000. We also have horrendous problems with backlogs and with, with, with lineups and queues, and I think uh, we need to do a much better job of, of making sure that we can um, process uh, visas much quicker. And from an economic point of view, I, I, I joke that in Vancouver, I don't have a constituency office, I have an immigration law practice. <laughs> and about 70% of the casework that comes in my office uh, is immigration related, huh. and often it's uh, local employers mm -hmm. who are trying to get skilled workers from abroad, and they gotta wait yeah. two, three, four years. Well, you can't run a business. I mean, you need someone, you need an efficient process. So I know that that's something that is, is a big issue in Canada. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the issues in the United States. I think uh, the pressure on the southern border is, is, is a, something that we don't experience in Canada. Yeah. And where I'll conclude is by saying that um, uh, I agree with Bill. One thing that I think is very important whenever we get together is to differentiate the northern border from the southern border. 
uh, and you know the 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 issues that we have between Canada and the United States are far different than the issues that exist between Mexico yeah. and the United States, and uh, that's important for us to keep in mind. We we agree, and that's a huge part of why this organization exists. Actually, is to help educate uh, U.S. policymakers about mm -hmm. the special nature of the relationship. But Rob, did you want to get in on the immigration yeah. discussion? Yeah, on the immigration, I would agree with Don that we need to increase immigration. There's no question that. But the big question is how you're how how to do that and who you're going to let in and. Uh, just say from a broad perspective, and there's lots of changes that have been made and uh, are going to be made with regard to immigration, but uh, we, we want to match uh, the immigrants' abilities and qualifications to labor force demands. So it's no good to bring an immigrant in if, if it doesn't meet the demand that we need in right. the labor force. So that is something that we have done a poor job of up till now. We have brought in the temporary foreign worker program that runs under that model where you're sponsored in by an employer uh, to, but that's, that's a temporary program that that you can't build a country on a, on a temporary program. You have to have a permanent uh, process to allow them to earn citizenship under that process, whether it's, you know, that program or something like it that will, will match, uh, match demand uh, to those, those coming in. And that's how we grow the country. Uh, we, we probably will approach the place where we could use about a million uh, immigrants per year. Uh, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, where, where I'm from, in Alberta, the number one limiting factor on, on opportunity there is uh, labor force demand. We, yeah. we just do, we have way more jobs than we have ability to fill. Uh, that, is, uh, that is what's retarding uh, our ability to continue to grow, which is unique, I would say, in, in Canada and probably in North America, but it, it certainly is a real problem that we have to address, and uh, we're going we're gonna to work to make that happen. Yeah, we're actually going to do a little bit more of a deep dive on this conversation a little later in the day. We have a terrific panel on um, skills, education, and labor mobility. So I, I look forward to that, and hopefully this was just a little bit of a preview of that. Um, we have about 30 minutes left, so I want to get uh, all of y'all into the conversation. And just um, in case you're shy and worried about asking a question, I'll, I'll ask one to, to get everybody going. I can't help with three politicians on the stage um, to ask some political questions. So I'm just going to throw out a couple of them, and you guys can jump in. Um, one of them is there are two governor's races going on in the United States right now that, are, that people are paying attention to, New Jersey and Virginia. I think uh, in New Jersey, I think people think, and, and I'd like Bill for you to talk about this a little. I think Chris Christie, the incumbent, the Republican, probably wins by a lot. Uh, and he's really uh, uh, become very interesting as a potential Republican presidential nominee. Um, so, so let's talk about Chris Christie. In Virginia, you've got Terry McAuliffe, the Democrat, who's probably going to win. Um, but anyway, so if you could talk a little bit about politics, Bill. And then for you two guys, um, I couldn't help but read in the polls that uh, it looks like there's a three-way split between who Canadians um, are supporting, third NDP, third liberal, third conservatives. And I just wonder um, what politics are like right now and what that means um, for, for you guys going forward. So Bill, politics. I think Governor Christie is likely to win. Um, I think that um, Mr. McAuliffe is likely to win. What is interesting to me also is the New York City race oh, with yeah. Bill de Blasio. When does that happen? Uh, t uh, today. It's today. Okay. It's today. Um, the reason that those are interesting to me is... Bill, is wait a minute. You didn't say who's going to win New York City. Oh, Bill? Bill de Blasio. Okay. All right. right. He's up by something deal. like 40 points. Oh, okay. Um, so, so you're not really going out on a limb. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, what's been interesting to me is the polling surrounding these races. Uh, the Christie race, probably not as interesting. Um, he is an individual, I think, that is viewed as independent by Democrats and Republicans. So uh, he is a little bit different place in this, whereas in Virginia and in New York City, it's more clear the, um, uh, that people are identified by their parties. But the polling indicates that in uh, many of these races, when they poll Republicans, that they, Republicans are saying they are not voting for the Republican because the person is a Republican. And that is, um, I think, a very different uh, spin on where we've been before. Why are they voting if it's not the party? Well, you I mean, where are they voting? Mm -hmm. um, it's not clear necessarily that they are. Mm -hmm. They may just be stay home votes. Uh, Okay. Um, but they are clearly leaning uh, towards Democrats. Um, and a lot of that, the belief is, comes out of the shutdown. So 
uh, if that were to hold true, that would be a major change in U.S. politics yeah. uh, from what it's been in, in the recent uh, past. I think Americans' um, retention of these kinds of issues is relatively short, uh, so that we probably uh, can't assume that this will have any impact beyond these couple of races. But it is an interesting uh, polling trend, and um, these are interesting data points. Winston Churchill, I think, said of the United States that we always get to the right answer after we've absolutely exhausted every other option. <laughs> so we'll see. You guys want to talk politics? Kelly Johnson's coming up to the mic, so he might save you, but. Sure. Well, I, I just hope May, Mayor Bloomberg maybe comes to Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> um, really? You don't like to drink big sodas up there? <laughs> um, Ooh. Just yeah, it's interesting. I, I think, uh, you know, uh, Rob may agree, it's uh, polls in Canada are, are a little bit fickle. Um, they're they're not, uh, not horribly reliable. Uh, there's been some, some recent uh, surprises in terms of what the polling has suggested and, and the election outcomes. But having said that, um, I do think that the Canadian political situation right now is very competitive between the three parties. Um, you know, the, the Conservatives, uh, what is it, Rob, a 12-seat? You have a 12-seat majority? Uh, yes, I think 12, so. Yeah. So, um, you know, they say they have a strong, stable Conservative majority, and, and, and we say, well, they have a 12-seat 12, 12 um, uh, majority. But they're so united on the right, and they you're are. divided on they the are. left, right? And, so and, and they, they Is do. that ever going to change, you think, by the way? While we're here, let's just throw it out there. Is what what going to change? Is the left going to unite the way the right did? Well, we're very united taboo? in the New yeah. Democratic Party. Uh, okay. Um, I, I, maybe I should step in and save him. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, so, but uh, no, I think it, I think Don is right. It, you're in the middle of a, an election cycle. It's two years before election day, and uh, polls, any polls that you want to look at, I would take with a grain of salt at this stage of the game. So I, I would say the same if we were ten points up. I wouldn't believe it, I, because it can change so radically. Uh, and so much can happen between now and then. Uh, but uh, when it goes into an election, doesn't matter what the polls are, you're always 10 points behind. You should be running that way yeah. and uh, earning the support of Canadians in that. It, we have done, a, I believe, a very good job in the economy. That's where Canada's rated number one place in the world. That surprised us, to be perfectly honest. When's the last time you heard Canada rated number one as a place to do business? And we've been consecutive for a number of years that way. So we were very proud of that, and that's not by accident. There's some significant things that have, that have happened to make that happen. And if the next election, that is the economy, uh, is the election or the ballot box question, people are concerned about it, then I believe we'll be held in good stead. But part uh, of why you're number one, by the way, I think it's been good governance. I also think you're lucky in who your neighbors are. Just, I'm well, biased, but no, that, uh, pretty big market. Uh, let's talk about the neighbors because yeah. I think there's a lesson there, and you, you touched on it. Uh, I believe the Democratic Party will be in power for a significant time to come unless the, the, the Republicans uh, put their parties together. And uh, when you're divided uh, internally or externally on right or left, uh, you are at a significant disadvantage to the support of the, of the masses, uh, it, whether it's in the United States or Canada. We, we went through 13 years of that in Canada. We learned a lesson. Uh, we put ourselves together. And, and uh, I, I believe the Republican Party in the United States has uh, still got to learn that lesson. Well, that having been said, I, I don't know, p students of history would know that in the United States since 1990, 1954, I think, there's only been one time when a president has actually essentially been elected to a third term, um, and that was George Bush to Reagan's third term. Uh, so I think the odds, I would, I would just disagree with you a little bit, the odds, at least at the presidential level, for a Democrat succeeding Barack Obama, um, I, I think that's a tough sled, but we'll see. Kelly Johnson. Uh, thank you. I'll give you guys a break from politics for a second. That's unlike you, Kelly. <laughs> I know, but uh, they, you've done a good job already on the political <laughs> questions. First of all, I, wanna, I really want to thank Congressman Owens, uh, one, for being here, and number two, for being a real champion on U.S.-Canada relations. You, more than any of your colleagues in the House or the Senate, really get it and understand the importance of this economic relationship. Uh, there's so many of us, whether in your automobile industry or, in my case, in the food industry, uh, who understand that we have a very highly integrated North American supply chain and market. Mm -hmm. and what that means. And one of the things that, that uh, one of my favorite quotes from uh, former ambassador to the U.S., Michael Wilson, said that we make things together. I, I would add further, we innovate together, and, and so it, everything we do together is it helps each other be successful. Mm -hmm. 
having said that, Congressman, I'm, I'm, and this is also a question for, for the other members of Parliament that are here as well, um, there is a high degree of frustration with those of us in the business community, both in the U.S. and Canada, about the lack of um, movement on, on whether it's regulatory cooperation or other aspects. Mm -hmm. Because ever since 9-11, we've seen a real thickening in the border. Now, it's thinned a little bit over time. It's gotten there's, there's some improvements, but there, it's going slowly. And I wonder sometimes, and I just want to ask you, should Rob in his position as kind of the congressional liaison also maybe focus more on the states as laboratories for improvement of order versus on Congress in order to really see what can actually do and actually help uh, get done. So just throw it out to your part of all of you to respond. Certainly. Um, actually, we were having this conversation largely this morning at breakfast uh, with a group of uh, uh, members of Parliament and the Senate. Uh, one of the issues that we have, as I said in my opening remarks, is that it works, so it is not a focus in Canada, uh, in, in Washington. People are not focused on this relationship. Um, what can you do to encourage members to focus on it and senators to focus on it? Uh, I think that really uh, requires uh, an educational process. And, you know, Rob comes down, other members uh, of parliament come down, certainly the Canadian ambassador is very active. However, again, th there's not much that's, if you will, sexy out there. But what we did talk about today was encouraging the business people who are running plants in various parts of the country to go visit the members in their districts, make an appointment in the district office, talk about what the Canadian relationship means in that state, how many jobs it is, because that really brings it home. Uh, and I can tell you uh, that many, if not most of my colleagues, are not focused on this relationship, simply not focused. And it's not because they have any negative feelings, but again, because it works. There is no squeak in the wheel, or very few. And the things we're trying to change are largely tinkering with the relationship as opposed to major policy changes like we're trying to implement on the southern border or in some of the uh, trade agreements we're negotiating, TPP, European. Um, so that's my suggestion, is that really you encourage the Canadian businesses to go visit members of Congress in their area. And frequently, the people who will be going to visit will be constituents who work in those businesses. But actually, uh, you're absolutely right, uh, Bill, and, and we do one step further than that. Uh, and the questioner is absolutely right. You have to. When I go and talk to a, one of your colleagues in Washington, uh, if I haven't done my homework and, and I'd license that person to be engaged in that issue back in their district, you do that through uh, my contacts, uh, international trade, um, lobbied all the time. Uh, we always have Canadian subsidiaries in America, the U.S. Uh, Chamber of Commerce, the exporters and manufacturers, and uh, uh, Scotty, the organization here, uh, any, the private sector. The private sector has such a role to, to engage in the district. Then you've licensed that par parliamentarian to become engaged in that issue. If you haven't done that work, then uh, I might as well talk to the wall in the back of the room as to talk to congressmen in D.C. because they haven't, uh, it hasn't boiled to where they can actually uh, do something about it. Uh, I have a lot of friends and, and colleagues in, in uh, the Congress and in Senate built up over a number of years, but, but uh, they... Uh, and they're they all have, on this stage, just Well, kidding. they have no, <laughs> no, they, don't, they, have, they have no, uh, they have no ill feelings about Canada. Right. They, they right. just are really quite um, uninformed. Yeah. I usually tease them a little bit. I say, well, it's not your fault. You know, it's the weather. And they say, well, what do you mean it's the weather? I say, well, if you look at a weather map in America, it goes to the 49th parallel and it goes blank. So they're sure yeah. there's nothing up here, yeah. and it's reinforced every night. Yeah, and that's, that's true. Uh, that's where it's, at. It's, it's true, absolutely. So I'm just going to ask my colleagues to try to keep shorter answers so that we can get more questions, because we've got quite the lineup. Laura Dawson. Congressman Owens, your, your statement that when you have something that works, you res, uh, devote resources to strengthen it is so simple and so correct, and it's exactly the opposite of what we're doing 
in our Canada-US economic and border relationship. We're going madly off in all directions. We're negotiating a TPP with other people, but we're not talking to each other. We're negotiating with the EU, but we're not coordinating our trade policies. We are ignoring our largest trading relationship, and we're ignoring the N-word, which is NAFTA. The U.S. exports more to its NAFTA partners than it does to the European Union, to Asia, to Latin America, to the other eight of the U.S.'s top trading partners combined. But nobody is doing anything to strengthen that relationship. So my question for you folks is, do you think that a trilateral relationship that Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. is the basis for North American competitiveness? And secondly, what are we going to do about it? Thanks, Laura. Question. Rob? Jump in? No, I, I, you're absolutely right. Um, what we have to do is thin the border down. The regulatory cooperation beyond the border initiative, I fear more than anything, that the political support for the program on both sides of the border uh, would diminish in any way. And I think it's uh, you know, important for everyone in this room uh, to engage as much as they possibly can to make that happen. Why? Because that productivity that will be gained by the fluidity of the supply chains on whatever industry it is will allow us the competitive advantage that we need to capitalize on the growing international market east and west of us. And it doesn't matter, uh, you know, uh, Ambassador Jacobson used to always say if Canada sells anything to overseas to Asia, 25 cents of every dollar goes right back to the American currency. And that's absolutely true. Uh, we are linked together in our supply chains. We need to realize this. Europe's got it right. They had it right for many years ago. That there should be just a welcome sign, the 49th parallel, as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, and those supply chains should be uh, totally uh, fluid back and forth. Now, that's not government policy. That's my, that's my view. Uh, but I, I think we'll it just We'll mention that sense. to Assistant Secretary Burson yeah, know, from Homeland Security when he's on the panel this afternoon, and we'll see. We'll give him a chance. But, but that's that. how you go after the growing markets, which is between now and 2025, estimations of some 70% increase in international trade envelope globally. America can grow out of the debt crisis situation they're in, but they have to capitalize on that, and they haven't an opportunity to make any mistakes. I, I don't think uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Laura, I was going to call you, is satisfied, <laughs> but we're going we're gonna to keep going here. Mark Cameron. Uh, if I can sneak in two questions just to build on, on Laura's question. When we negotiate with, with Korea or Europe, why would we do it together? Why don't, why don't have, I mean, rather than U.S. and Canada being played off against each other in these negotiations as has happened in, in, uh, in Korea where we weren't able to close a deal apart because the U.S. got out ahead of us, well, why, don't, why don't have us go together to India and Japan and some of these other countries? Oh, you're mad that the U.S. got out ahead of uh, Canada on Korea? Can we talk about Canada-EU for a yeah, minute, but, dude? But you, but they're, they're still going to really? negotiate with you You're mad about that? Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Um, my, my second question, uh, Congressman Owens, I think you're, you have been a supporter of, of Keystone, and I'd be curious to know what you think it would take to get uh, more Democrats in the administration to ultimately support Keystone. Thank you, Mark. The elephant in the room. <laughs> uh, that, the answer to your question I actually can't provide. Um, my support of Keystone is really one that um, has some short-term <laughs> view to it, but mine is much more a long-term view. We are clearly always going to need some foreign oil, if you will, into the United States for the foreseeable future. I'd much rather get it from a trusted neighbor than ship it a couple of thousand miles um, from someone or a region that I think is going to have tremendous pressure to ship that oil further east for higher profits. So. To me, this is a long-term look, not a short-term look. Um, that's been changed somewhat by the rather rapid uh, development of our ability to tap into natural gas. Um, I think that's actually going to change the equation in many respects relative to a lot of free trade agreements, because uh, there may well be in North America the ability to bring back many of the jobs that went to particularly Southeast Asia uh, for manufacturing. Um, if that happens, uh, really what you negotiate in those free trade agreements um, is less about protecting us, I think, and more about how do we encourage those businesses to come back. Lots of issues in that process, but my focus is how do we set up these free trade agreements so that we are encouraging the repatriation 
of manufacturing and other uh, developing technologies into North America. Well, and the other question, maybe the, our two gentlemen can, I'm going to stick with energy for a second, but just so that Mark, um, we answer his question, which is why aren't the United States and Canada and Mexico, perhaps, to Laura's question, as a trading block and the oldest and most successful one, um, negotiating these deals together um, with Korea, with Europe, with, uh, we are together on TPP, but why not? Is it a sovereignty thing? Is it a political thing? Is it just not practical? I mean, do y'all have a sense of that? Well, I wanted, okay, uh, I think the questioner, uh, Mark, asked uh, about Japan. Uh, one tremendous advantage that Canada has on a bilateral with Japan, it's a mature relationship. We've been trading for 40 plus years with, uh, with Japan, um, is that uh, we, uh, we don't grow rice. Um, we don't have a lot of the irritants that uh, would enter into some of those trade ar arrangements that we'll get into with the TPP as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, we're part of the TPP, very pleased to be, we encourage that process to go along and I think the Canada-EU deal, which is a comprehensive deal, is an example. If we'd have gone in with the United States, I don't believe that would have been as comprehensive. Uh, because it's as comprehensive, or do we expect America and Europe to be as comprehensive? We hope so, but I, I'm, I would be really surprised. Uh, but it will certainly push okay. the table a lot further along yeah. in that direction because of Canada EU free trade agreement. You, you know, we did a we just did a study on uh, the potential impacts of a trade agreement between Canada and India, and I was struck by uh, more than one witness who pointed out that New Delhi is exactly on the opposite side of the world to I think it was Toronto. Hmm. There are and what the lesson I derive from that is that. Although, we, of course, as a general proposition, we want to encourage trade with, with many areas of the world, and India is an attractive one because it's a BRIC country and it's got a booming middle class and it's got a lot of the metrics that we would be looking for to, to improve our trade with them. There are some natural reasons why we don't trade a lot with India. They're on the other side of the world. When you look at North America, the reason, I mean, there's, there's, there's all sorts of cultural, social, and economic, political reasons why we're so tightly integrated. But it makes a lot of sense for Canada, the United States, and Mexico to have a very integrated, strong trading relationship. And, and um, I do think we need to be looking for ways that we can leverage that. Um, in terms of, of bargaining, I, I think we're in a flux period right now. Um, you know, the, from the 70s through the 90s, there was a strong push for GATT and for the WTO and for a multilateral approach to trade. Um, I think right now, if you talk to people about GATT, yeah, and, uh, and WTO, they'll tell you that uh, they just don't think that it's going anywhere. They don't think, they think that the enterprise is just too difficult to get everybody together. So what's happened is, is countries have um, scattered and we're approach, you know, we're, we're all pursuing sort of scattershot, bilateral, plurilateral, or regional agreements. Um, you know, everybody's familiar with the term spaghetti bowl, where we're, we may be left with a spaghetti bowl of trade agreements. Um, but uh, there is some reason for optimism there, which is um, perhaps it's by pursuing and building these, these, these trading relationships, country by country, group by group, that we actually will move eventually to a comprehensive world-based, a global-based, rules-based trading system, which is, I think, what everybody sort of would like to see. Um, in, in terms of energy, I mean, all I'll say is we're all grappling with, with similar issues. Um, you know, I think Canada, what we want to do is we want to be able to get our oil to market. That's true. But one thing that my party would like to see is more processing of that primary good here in Canada. Um, Canada used to have a very high percentage of our exports were primary or, or, or unprocessed goods. And that percentage, I think it was something like 70% in the 1940s of our exports were unprocessed. And that was slowly coming down over time to about 45% in 2009. Since then, since 2009, that percentage has crept back up to about 60%. So one thing that we'd like to see is get that, get that secondary uh, production here in Canada, build the refineries, process, develop a plastics industry, develop um, a petrochemical industry so that we get that value added production in Canada. And, uh, I think that all countries are grappling with that, and that's and of course we haven't mentioned this, and that's the environmental consideration. I don't think you can talk about the economy anymore without factoring in the environment, and 
that's, I think, one of the unresolved issues where when we talk about expanded fossil fuel production, um, one thing we need to do is, I think, give equivalent effort policy-wise uh, to, to looking for ways that we can ameliorate the environmental problems. And I think if we do that, that will make the political sale of, of things like pipelines and export of fossil fuels easier. Agreed. We actually had a very good discussion, I think, on um, environmental stewardship and, uh, and, and what you do uh, in the realm of corporate social responsibility on the corporate side. Let's stick with energy for a couple more minutes, though. Um, go government policy absolutely has a role to play. Um, Bill, you talked about natural gas. It's interesting. Your home state of New York, um, I would say, has a more cautious approach mm -hmm. to the development of natural gas and then technologies like hydraulic fracturing than, for example, its neighbor Pennsylvania. The fact that New York has decided to go slow has actually been an economic boon to Pennsylvania. Um, I wonder if we could all three of you talk a little bit about natural gas and what it means. Can the whole world has a lot of it. Canada and the United States in particular have a lot of it. Christy Clark, the premier of your province, Don, was just in D.C a couple weeks ago touting uh, LNG exports. Uh, if Canada really did become a gigantic exporter of LNG and beat the U.S. to that, uh, since, for example, New York is going slow on its development, that would be uh, an enormous shift in terms of the way we uh, deal with energy in the world. So can, you, can we dive yeah. a little more into energy? Yeah, I think it's very good. And I come from Alberta. Energy is uh, a large part of the economy there. We've heard that, yeah. <laughs> but but you, what you've heard is oil sands and its development, and it is a phenomenal opportunity for Canada and uh, actually all of North America. And we talked about the pipeline. But the next big play in energy is LNG. And you saw actually last Thursday a Japanese corporation applied for um, permitting of uh, LNG plant uh, west coast. You'll see there's a potential of you know, eight, uh, I've heard even as high as a dozen of these LNG projects being planned. Uh, when we talk to uh, the international players who are looking to Canada, oh, there's Japan, it's Korea, it's China, it's India, all of them and more, all want two fundamental things. They want food security and energy security. Mm -hmm. And we're in a position in Canada, uh, very blessed to be able to provide both. And these are golden opportunities for us. So are we going to get LNG to coast? Yes, absolutely. Are we going to get oil to coast? Yes. What we're debating is whether it's going by rail or it's going by pipe. That's really the only thing we're debating. And, uh, and both coasts, you think? We've I got believe, the West Coast I believe in BC, both but coasts. what about the East Coast? I know TransCanada's got a project proposal to go to New Brunswick. There, there are two pipelines to the East, two to the West, and two to the South. I believe in a decade and a half we'll have all of them. Bill? I think, well, New York has clearly gone a little slower than I think people anticipated a couple of years ago. Um, I'm not sure that long term that is particularly important. Uh, I think that the window here is about five years, uh, and we will see significant uh, increases in natural gas production. Um, and I think that it will largely be driven by uh, the need to regrow local economies. There is clearly uh, legitimate, in my view, concern about uh, the environmental impacts of uh, natural gas, uh, gas production, particularly fracking, uh, and that needs to be addressed. But I think it can be, and it can be done in a practical way that gets us to uh, a level of production that allows us to bring, again, bring back those jobs. There's no there's nothing we can do that is risk-free. Um, so when you do, when you're having those conversations, you, I think you have to understand that if you take the position uh, that you're absolutely going to forbid a particular uh, form of energy to be um, developed, then you run a risk that you will deteriorate your economy. That has other environmental risks associated with it. So we have to figure out what the balance is and, and move forward, and that requires us to compromise, uh, not something we've been doing real well in Washington lately. Final thought before we go to Paul. Well, I'm not an expert in, in the, uh, the dangers of hydraulic fracking, but I, I do know that significant and real concerns are raised about um, you know, the poisoning of groundwater and um, and potentially carcinogens being injected into the earth, and I don't, I don't know that we know exactly uh, enough at this point. Um, so I, I prefer a cautious approach. I mean, the gas isn't going anywhere. Um, I, I think that this the is the gas a, isn't, but if I may say, the investment is. It could be, yeah. yeah. But uh, 
you know, this may be a bad analogy, but it, it, if, you had, if you had gas in your backyard, and, uh, you know, obviously there's an economic imperative to develop it, and you could make a lot of money, but the price of it was that you poisoned your well, yeah. then um, I, th I think you've got, you've got some, some weighing to do, and I think that's some of the concerns. <clears throat> in British Columbia, there's a lot more political support for, for LNG production. Um, for a number of reasons, including the fact that there's less opposition to having uh, tankers off the coast of British Columbia transporting LNG. It's lighter, it evaporates if there were a spill. Um, it's, th there's, it's not as dangerous a substance in British Columbians' point of mind as, say, raw bitumen is, which sinks to the bottom, forms globules, and, and it's, it's more dangerous to, to our coastal waters. Um, but this is where I think we need to have a national discussion about our economy in a more broad f form. So in British Columbia, it's not just a question of LNG or, or pipelines or nothing. There's an issue of our coast is a very valuable economic asset to us. We have sustainable fishing, we have ecotourism, we have... We've got run of river we, hydro. We have forestry and we have, here's yeah. another competitor, is the Site C Dam proposal in the middle of British Columbia which, I mean, hydroelectric is one of the cleanest forms of energy. So there's, there's competing values for economic investment and for economic development that I think, are, I think are rational and reasonable. And I think we need to have a discussion. So many of these issues become mired in politics and uh, simplification, oversimplification, that uh, I think it doesn't do justice to the, the difficult issues in front of us. But um, we all want the same thing. We want orderly and safe and environmentally sensitive development of our economy. And we'd like to see these natural assets developed as best we can. Um, but I think it's an ongoing discussion. Agreed. Uh, last question, Paul Moen. Thanks, Scotty. Speaking of British Columbia. There you go. Um, OK, actually, uh, it's a nice segue into my question uh, in terms of energy, but also telecommunications. One of the big debates in Canada, and even, maybe even bigger in the US, is how, uh, engagement with China. And we've talked a little bit about it, but maybe I could get the panel's thoughts a little bit more on how to engage China, not just as a market, but uh, at a foreign policy level as well as a trade level. From, from our perspective, uh, clearly, we are, relatively speaking, engaged uh, with China from a trade, uh, from the trade arena. Um, there are lots of questions out there, whether you're talking national security issues, um, whether you're talking uh, the South, uh, South Pacific, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, we clearly are making a military shift to that region uh, because we believe that uh, that's necessary from our national security perspective. Um, engaging China uh, has some difficulties associated with it. Uh, I think that we have reasonable evidence that uh, they have uh, stolen a, a significant amount of our intellectual property over the last 10 years, minimally, uh, and that they don't honor, in most cases, uh, patents and trademarks. Uh, there's a tremendous number of knockoffs that come uh, into, I suspect, Canada. I know in the United States. Uh, the ability to engage the Chinese on a, uh, if you will, a fair trade basis, I think is much more difficult than it is with many other countries. This is, this is for real the last question, because then we're, we're going to wrap up. So I'm going to give each of you guys a, a minute to say final words, but let's do this quick. Really quick. Ron Cannon, Member of Parliament for Colonial Lake Country, also a member of the Trade Committee and the Canada-U.S. Interparliamentary Committee. Thank you very much uh, for the, your uh, presence here this morning, Congressman. Had a chance over breakfast, but one issue we didn't discuss, I know uh, Don mentioned about the country of origin labeling. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. But the other one from a, a pet peeve uh, for as a British Columbian and coming from the international award-winning wine region, best Pinot Noir in the, in the world out of the Okanagan, but also the interprovincial trade barriers. Congressman, maybe you could share a little bit from the U.S. experience, how we can learn from your experience and how we can break down the interprovincial trade barriers in Canada. Thank you. Ooh. Relative to wine? <laughs> <laughs> Pour more of it, right? Uh, we have... Um, an interesting situation actually in western New York, uh, the western part of my district, uh, where Canadians who come down have to pay the provincial tax when they go back across the border with their wine. Uh, and that's been an issue for those north northwestern uh, folks in terms of how to deal with that. 
Um, fact of the matter is, I've had a number of conversations with um, uh, a variety of members of parliament on this, um, had some conversations with uh, Gary Doerr's uh, office in DC, and it is a provincial issue in, in the states. We have simply have not, have not done that. Uh, one of the things we talked about was, in fact, would New York State pass a, a, a law that would uh, impose a tax on Can uh, Americans bringing wine back? And that simply didn't pass muster with us. It didn't make sense to do that. It not only was a negative trade barrier, but it was going to cost New Yorkers more. So for our, from our perspective, it didn't work. I honestly couldn't give you a, a solution in, in terms of how you do it. I just know that we are focused on that in the western part of New York, basically Watertown the, and the uh, Thousand Islands region. I, I, last word, and then Don, you'll have the last word. Yeah, I can talk about uh, the country of origin labeling. Uh, it's something that I've absorbed uh, or spent most of the summer actually dealing with. The farm bill has come up. Uh, <laughs> it is now in comfrey. Uh, we have uh, worked very hard and aggressively to impress upon them the importance of complying with WTO uh, ruling. If that does not happen, we're headed into a trade war, which nobody wins. So nobody wins at a war. So we want to avoid that as much as we possibly can. But this is very critical to our industry. It's a billion dollar hit to the hog and beef industry of Canada, and it goes against world trade rules. And so uh, this can be fixed. It was a congressional amendment that was put on the Farm Bill in 208 that, that caused the problem. It's uh, only Congress that actually can fix this one. Uh, we believe that uh, that we have the votes and and there is a will to have something done uh, while it's in conference and uh, we're we're expecting that it's not done till it's done but I'll be uh, taking a group and Minister Ritz and I'll be there with uh, others uh, next week uh, reinforcing that uh, as aggressively as we possibly can with those decision makers in Comfrey. Thanks. Don, last words? A couple of quick points on, on uh, internal Canadian trade. I mean, it's often said that we don't have free trade in Canada. Yeah. Uh, there's been some progress in terms of the agreement on internal trade, but there still are, uh, in many people's <coughs> views, uh, far too many barriers, um, both in terms of labor mobility and in terms of, uh, of, of moving products and different regulations. I mean, I guess that's one of the one of the charms of, of living in a federation where you have provincial jurisdiction on many issues, so it can be complex. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to do more on that. On China, I just want to say I was there last week with uh, on the Governor General State visit. We had meetings with uh, President Xi and Premier Li, and um, I'll, I'll I'll end with this. There was an article in the paper a few days ago by former Prime Minister Joe Clark, where it was his view that Canada can play and has played over the decades uh, an important role in brokering relationships and that uh, maybe sometimes the United States is, is, is not positioned to do. And I think that's a role that Canada can play in China. We have a unique relationship with China. Uh, you know, we recognized them, in, I think, before the United States. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we sold wheat. Uh, Norman Bethune is a very esteemed figure there. And uh, I think, um, you know, they're the second largest economy in the world. The States is number one. So I think there's some, some tensions there that Canada can do a job in brokering. And maybe this speaks to the Dr. Laura's question about maybe working together where we, we're not individual silos. Canada shouldn't be out in the world doing our own thing and the United States doing theirs. I think we can um, broker and leverage our relationship to both of our mutual benefit. And I think dealing with China may be a, a good example of where we can do that. Extraordinarily, extraordinarily well said. And just while we're talking about Canada-US, I just want to wrap by acknowledging two really distinguished and fantastic diplomats that serve and have served our countries. We have uh, Michael Kurgan, the former Canadian ambassador to the United States. Thank you for coming, Ambassador. Thank you for serving on our advisory board, and thanks for your public service. Uh, and we have Rich Sanders, the Chargé d'Affaires of the United States Embassy. We're thrilled that you're here. Uh, we had fun with you last night, so thank you for that. Um, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our fabulous panel.